I'm still alive, I'm still alive. I know, I haven't made a video in like, what, two months now? During a global pandemic when the economy's collapsing, I just space on all my sponsors. <laughs> I have no money. I've just been slowly losing my mind. All I've been doing lately is just going deep into the woods, making friends with all the local wildlife. So I've had a squirrel follow me before. I've never had a turkey follow me before. See you later, buddy. You don't have to come with me. Is he following me still? I know a lot of you are in the same boat as me, but besides the time I accidentally grazed the pinky of the drive through guy, I haven't touched another human being in over 70 days. I gotta be honest, guys, I, I thought I was losing it for a while there until I met Iron Man. Isn't she a cutie? I love you. What a sweetheart. And I know what you're thinking, why am I reviewing the Tiger King? Didn't that come out like a million years ago? Uh, yeah, I'm a little behind, all right? I got some catching up to do. Tiger King is a brilliant, amazing, visceral experience that invites you in gently with a big smile and cute fuzzy kitties before taking you on a wild ride of twists and turns, backstabs and deceit. This is perhaps one of the best documentary series I have ever seen. Tiger King is easily the biggest breakaway hit that any streaming service has ever had. Head. But is its viral success actually due to the fact that it was released on the world's most popular streaming service during a global pandemic when we're all forced to stay home? Yeah, but it's still good. Though this documentary talks about the general private tiger trade and the conditions at these private zoos, the main focus is Joe Exotic and this war game going on between all the private cat owners and all the drama that they generate over a four year period. Now, as for how I like the documentary, Filmmaking wise, it's so well made. It has a really high production value and it's edited so well, telling you a story that's doled out to you. And these large cat owners might seem awesome at first, but it gives you these subtle hints along the way as to who these people really are and what they're capable of doing. But that being said, every single interviewee is a very interesting person and the big cat owners are super eclectic. I would definitely recommend that anyone watch this. Now, as for how I enjoyed the documentary subject wise, I hated watching every second of it. I was already somewhat familiar with the large cat trade and what goes on in these private zoos. I don't really have a problem with private owners owning a couple large cats as long as they have the property size for it. But besides that, I hate everything to do with private cat ownership. Now I get it, I love large cats, tigers, lions. Lions are my favorite animal. And I get the dream of wanting to pet one and and wrestle with one and have it think that you're its, its mommy or its daddy or whatever and have that cuddly relationship with it. But here's the thing, you can't. You can get that from a large cat for maybe a short period of time, but it is not within their DNA to be that. These large cats have not been domesticated yet. We have had things like this in our homes for literally thousands of years. These have acclimated to life with us and we're, generally larger than them, so they learn to depend on us and realize that they basically are babies to us and they submit to us as babies. To get a similar effect from a large cat, you have to take the baby from the mother the second it's born, you have to raise it in your bedroom and it has to learn that you are its actual mother or father. But the problem is, once they get big, they learn very quickly that they are larger than you and that they are not in any way your inferior. And even if you think you have the tamest large cat ever, they can still I also wanted to point out that every single owner featured was abusing their animals simply by the virtue of owning so many of them in such a small space. Except for maybe the guy that had three wives. I mean, that could work. They don't need that much space. If you're squeamish, don't worry. They don't show a ton of overt abuse, but uh, they do show some like skeletons and stuff here and there. And the living conditions of some of these cats, especially at Carol Baskin's place was a little depressing. But all these guys are narcissists. Every, every single one of them, none of them are redeemable. And in the end, there's no hero. Nobody comes out on top. There's no winner. Everybody's a douche. The documentary starts with Joe Exotic, the main character, calling from jail. And honestly, 
quite a few of the employees deserve jail time too. Speaking of which, I wanted to point out that every single owner was also abusing their employees. Each of them to like different degrees though. Like Carol Baskin, the least abusive boss, was just exploiting volunteers. Volunteers are kind of suckers. But on the entire opposite side of the spectrum, you got Dr. Baba Ganoush over here running his own sex cult. If you're going into this not knowing a lot about the large cat trade, the documentary sort of lulls you in with this false sense of security. Big smiles, happy families, joyous employees telling stories of gratitude. If it weren't for Joe Exotic, I'd be on the street right now. Yes, how honorable it is for Joe Exotic to take on all of these wayward souls and show them a path to redemption. But it keeps giving you these hints, even right from the beginning, that you shouldn't trust any of these people, that there are cracks in their armor, and that behind the facade of beautiful, happy, fuzzy kitties is actually a cesspool of garbage. It becomes evident so quickly that Joe Exotic is a false messiah, using the image of the king of misfit toys to seduce his victims. He prefers lost boys because they're easier to exploit. And he doesn't even seem to really love his his cats. He just loves the power that comes with being a large cat owner and having thousands of people come to his place to admire him for being this daddy of big cats. The only difference between my pet and your pet is mine have three inch teeth and they weigh 400 pounds. In my eyes, the sign of a good documentary is that the filmmaker sort of disappears into the background. He starts off the series by setting it up, giving it context, saying that he accidentally ran into this large cat owner, and then next thing you know, he's on the property of the guy that Scarface was based on. As for Joe Exotic himself, like many of you, I'm sure, uh, I learned about him years ago when he started a campaign to run for governor. I am not cutting my hair. I'm not changing the way I dress. I refuse to wear a suit. I am gay. I've had two boyfriends most of my life. I've had some kinky sex. I have tried drugs. I'm broke as shit. <laughs> Those campaign ads were hilarious. I thought back then that maybe he had that crutch because uh, he had like a problem with his leg. But now after watching the documentary, I think it's pretty clear that he had it because it was a secret weapon that he could carry with him to, to prod off the attacking tigers. It goes on. Ow, son of a bitch. <laughs> But the first interviewee that they show, uh, the guy that they use to sort of frame everything, is another documentary filmmaker. He was actually going to create a reality show with, with Joe Exotic as the main character. I don't remember his name, let's just call him Hindsight Jerry because he's lamenting his decision to bolster Joe Exotic's ego. You can say that now because you're, you're out of it, but if you actually look at some of the stuff that he was doing. He was literally making propaganda for Joe Exotic. One of Joe's employees lost their hand. This had to have been the most terrifying traumatic event a human being could experience. And <laughs> yet, yet you're back on the park today, still loyal, still working, still loving these cats. Carol Baskin, she's framed as like the main antagonist. In Joe Exotic's eyes, she's definitely the villain of the war. I consider that bitch to be one of the biggest terrorists in the exotic animal world right now. The intrigue the intriguing thing with her is a question as to whether or not she killed her last husband. I don't want to give away too much of that. I think that it's definitely possible. I would love to say that I believe she did it, but um, unfortunately there really is not enough evidence. And the fact is that he was a terrible pilot and he didn't have his pilot's license, yet would fly, uh, like stunt fly, over the gulf. So. He might have just crashed. But uh, she gets a new husband, and the dude is hilarious. Uh, clearly, you can tell that she uh, married up in the... Uh... Everybody's made this joke already. Do you, do you want me to make the joke again? I would characterize her as reasonably rational. And then there's Dr. Bhagavan Antle. He's sort of a tertiary character. I guess he works as sort of a reference point to give you an idea of just how crazy these large cat owners can get. Again, I don't want to give away too much, but I will make fun of him for thinking that he's a Bhagavan though. Clearly he's not, because if he were, he wouldn't be running a sex cult and overbreeding tigers and euthanizing them after they've aged out. But the best thing about him is that he's obviously a complete control freak. This dude's ego is even worse than mine, and that's saying a lot. He directs 
the documentary staff and he often turns on and off his show voice. There's so many crazy characters, each more sketchy than the last. And just when you think it's impossible for there to be a bigger douchebag, behold, a pale horse. Jeff Lowe in his chromed out Hummer with a penciled on goatee wearing a Harley Davidson leather jacket and a flat brimmed hat. I mean, the guy literally wore a Ferrari hat to a funeral. The man is smart though clearly does very well for himself. This documentary did create sort of an interesting debate though. I've seen a few reviewers bring up the idea that documentary creators have this obligation to communicate to their audience that bad people are bad, that they need to spell it out, and that this documentary didn't do a good enough job of making it clear that people like Joe Exotic and the other characters were bad people that did bad things. Apparently this documentary has bolstered the real fan base for these crazy characters. I think the fan base more than anything is really more of a result of the internet age. This is just the way people are. People nowadays are just drawn to fame. And really there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I don't really like those serial killer stands very much though. That's creepy. But I totally reject the idea that the filmmaker didn't make it clear that these people were bad people. Uh, yes, he framed it in a way where the characters got to think that they're being celebrated as these cool people, but really he was giving them enough rope to hang themselves. They would set something up to make themselves look like they were a hero. They would edit in either right afterwards or later in the series, something that would completely contradict that. And the filmmaker doesn't need to hold our hand. Besides, the kind of people that believe the constant stream of bullshit that comes from obvious narcissists are the same people that would drop $1,800 so that their family could see tigers three times in the same weekend. You can't put a price on holding a baby tiger. I hit the lottery, I'll pay these people whatever they want for me to go down on a reservation every day and play with them. <laughs> and honestly, who gives a fuck? When I was a little kid, I went to a couple of these private zoos. At least one of them focused on large cats, and I really didn't like it. I could tell that the cats all hated it. They were all overcrowded in these tiny little cages, and they had these little beaten paths along the outside, and they would just pace back and forth along those paths because they had nothing else to do. That looks like hell. And I get it, after you've bred these cats, you can't just release them into the wild. They'll never reacclimate. And there's kind of a problem because a lot of these large cat owners think that they're doing the Lord's work because there's not a lot of these cats left in the wild, so you better breed more, except there's nowhere for them to go. Your backyard is not a place for a tiger to go. There's a documentary about an old tiger in India and the filmmaker followed the tiger literally hundreds of miles across India. I would never go into business with any of these people and I would love to go out for a beer with most of them. I have so many questions, except for Carol. I don't like her.